Hello, this is Rogers Redding, National Coordinator of Football Officials. This is number six in our series of videos we're creating for the fans and the media. We've got a lot of great plays this week. We've got a couple of targeting plays that we want to talk through and some other situations that are fairly unusual. So I hope you find these interesting and we'll learn something from them. Okay, let's get right to the plays. This pass play gives us a nice example of offensive pass interference. Watch the player on the end of the line to the right. His number is 11. It's kind of hard to see his number initially. But watch what he does. He goes downfield on this pass and blocks a couple of defenders, and then the receiver cuts off that block to catch the pass. Now, you see, we see this better on the replay. In fact, the TV people make a nice drawing of what's going on here. You can see that the receiver, number 11, goes out, blocks down on a couple of defenders, and then the receiver who catches the pass runs his route behind those blocks to catch the pass. So good call, offensive pass interference. Pass interference. Offense number 11. This kickoff play gives us a nice example of what is known as the momentum rule. You can see that the player at the goal line catches the ball in the field of play and his momentum takes him in the end zone where he takes a knee. The officials have initially ruled touchback on the play. Whether it's a safety or a touchback depends on who is responsible for the ball being in the end zone. So in this situation, if it is the kicking team responsible for the ball being in the end zone, that would be a touchback. If the receiving team is responsible for the ball being in its own end zone, that would be a safety. However, the rule allows for the possibility that a player's momentum would carry him into the end zone. And in that case, it's neither a touchback nor a safety. The ball simply belongs to the receiving team at the spot in the field of play where he caught the ball. That's the rule if it's inside the five-yard line. If it's outside the five-yard line, no matter how he takes the ball in the end zone, whether momentum or not, that would be a safety. But inside the five yard line, he's allowed the possibility of getting the ball in the end zone because of momentum where the ball is declared dead. And so this ball is correctly placed after review, this ball is correctly placed at the one yard line. And the referee makes a very nice explanation of this as a result of the review. Coming back to the wall. After further review, the receiver caught the ball at the one yard line. His momentum took him into the end zone. Therefore, the ball will be placed at the one yard line, first and 10. Here's one of the most interesting plays we've had in the last couple of weeks. The receiver clearly steps out of bounds and then comes back in and establishes inbounds before catching the ball. You can see this on the pylon cam shot that shows that he clearly steps out of bounds and also clearly reestablishes inbounds before touching the pass. So the question is whether or not he went out of bounds on his own or went out of bounds because of being forced out by a defensive player. If he goes out of bounds on his own and then comes back in to catch the pass, that is illegal touching and it is, it is a foul. The penalty is loss of down at the previous spot. If he is pushed out of bounds, that is if there's contact with a defender and that contact is deemed to have forced him out of bounds and then he comes back in and makes the catch, that is a legal catch and not a foul. That's what the ruling on the field was, that he was forced out of bounds, came back in and caught the ball. The play of course went to review and the instant replay official can certainly look at whether or not the player stepped out of bounds and then came back in to reestablish inbounds, and that's clear from the video. With regard to how the player went out of bounds, that is whether he was forced out or went out on his own, what instant replay can look at is whether or not there was contact with the defensive player. Instant replay cannot rule on whether or not the contact actually forced him out of bounds, that is to say, it cannot rule on the severity of the contact. Replay can only make a ruling as to whether or not there was contact. That's a yes or no question for instant replay. And if there's no contact, then replay can say no, he went out of bounds on his own. But if there's any contact at all, replay cannot determine whether the contact itself actually forced him to go out of bounds. After reviewing the play, 
the instant replay official determined that there was contact, and so therefore the call on the field of a catch was confirmed. After video the review, the ruling on the field of the catch for a first down is confirmed. On this play, you can see that the defender stops the ball carrier, stops his progress, and then lifts him up and just slams him to the ground. And it's no surprise that this causes some reaction by both teams. And of course, the officials are forced to come in and try to break up this situation so that it doesn't get completely out of hand. This is a good call for unnecessary roughness. There was no need for the player to slam the ball carrier to the ground, and that's the reason for the initial foul. And so the officials try to get this sorted out and wind up penalizing both teams. And, but I just wanted you to see this play as an example of, of unnecessary roughness and how the officials are often called upon to get in and, and break up these potentially dangerous, unsportsmanlike situations. There were multiple fouls on the play. All after the play, personal foul, unnecessary roughness, defense number 24 for slamming the ball carrier. Also after the play, unsportsmanlike conduct, defense number 26, came onto the field from the sideline. That's his first unsportsmanlike foul. Personal foul, unnecessary roughness. Offense number 79. Those, that's his first. Those fouls all offset. It's third down. Here's a play that got a lot of attention and a lot of conversation, a lot of disagreement among people about whether the result was correct. The ruling on the field was targeting, and of course, by rule, all targeting fouls go to the replay for a review. And this was eventually overturned as not being a targeting foul. And there's some difference of opinion about whether or not this should be a targeting foul or whether or not it should have been overturned. So let's walk through this. The first thing to look for is an indicator. And remember, all of the indicators for targeting include the idea of attacking with forcible contact. It's not simply lowering the head. It's not simply a launch. It's not simply an upward thrust from a crouch. In order for it to be an indicator, each of these must be accompanied by attacking with forcible contact. So in this case, the player does lower his head, but it's hard to argue that he attacks with forcible contact. In fact, it's more like he's trying to absorb the blow rather than to deliver a blow. There's no doubt that there's helmet to helmet contact. And it's unfortunate that people still talk about helmet-to-helmet -helmet contact because helmet-to-helmet -helmet contact is not a part of the target he found. So this player does lower his head, but he does not attack with forcible contact. He does not lower his head to initiate forcible contact with the crown of the helmet. He doesn't launch. He doesn't thrust upward from a crouch. He doesn't do any of those things, but even if he had, those things all must be accompanied by attack with forcible contact. So because there is no indicator, this is correctly overturned as not being a targeting foul. After further review, the ruling on the field of a catch is confirmed. However, there is no foul for targeting. It's a first down. Here we have an illustration of the rule for blocking below the waist. Now I want you to look at some things as this play starts. First of all, notice that the ball is snapped at the 47 yard line. Watch the action of the player who is third man in from the right side of the formation. He's gonna make a block on an opponent from about the 43 yard line. Now this block is within the 10 to two region. That is to say, it is directly to the front of the, of the player being blocked and it within the 10 o'clock to two o'clock portion of his body to the front. And that would be a legal block if it is within five yards of the line of scrimmage. Now the official who throws the flag is deep. The back judge throws this flag. He is correct to do that because what he can see is the low block. What he cannot tell is whether or not the block is within five yards of the line of scrimmage. If it's within five yards of the line of scrimmage, it's legal. If it's beyond five yards, it is a foul. And so he can't tell whether or not the block takes place within the five yards or beyond the five yards. But the officials on the line of scrimmage, that is the head linesman and the line judge, can tell where this block takes place because they've got the perspective to allow them to see where the five yards is. 
So the officials get together and talk about it, and they determine correctly that the block took place within the five yards, and so the block is legal, there is no foul. And the referee makes an explanation of this as he describes the situation. It's a good example of the rule for blocking below the waist. There is no foul for an illegal low block below the waist. The foul occurred within five yards of the line of scrimmage. The result of the play is a first down. On this kickoff, it is an onside kick as the kicking team is wanting to get the ball back. And the question always arises, did the ball go 10 yards before the ball was touched by the kicking team? However, what is not often noticed is whether or not the kicking team blocks before the ball goes 10 yards. The rule is that the kicking team is not allowed to block before the ball goes 10 yards or before it's touched by the receivers. That is a play that is reviewable. And on this play, you can see that number five of the kicking team blocks when the ball is about at nine or nine and a half yards. So that is an illegal block. The officials on the field don't see that. They, they're looking for the ball going 10 yards before it's touched. But replay comes in and they can actually create this foul. This is one of the few fouls that instant replay can actually create from the booth. And they do that in this case. And so the onside kick is, is negated because of the fact that the kicking team blocks before the ball goes 10 yards. Prior to the ball going 10 yards, number five of the kicking team illegally blocks his opponent. This is an illegal block, five yards to the kicking team. Five yard penalty will be enforced on the 35 yard line and will re-kick from the 30. This play gives us an example of a foul by the offense, which is called an illegal shift. You can see that two players start in motion and then one player stops while the second player continues in motion and he does not get set for a full second before the snap. And so this is an, an illegal shift. In order for this to be legal, the second player would have to stop and then everybody would have to be still for one full second. And that of course doesn't happen here. Now it's okay to have one player in motion and you might say, well, at the time of the snap there was only one player in motion. That is true. But because the two players were moving, they all have to set for a full second before the snap. So even though at the time of the snap only one player was moving, it is still a foul and a really nice example of an illegal shift. Illegal shift, offense, five yard penalty, replay, third down. Well, that's it for this week. Thanks for watching these. This is number six in the series. We'll be back with one more, number seven, in a couple of weeks to close out the season. So thanks again for watching, and we'll be back with you again in a couple of weeks.